Press Now, your source for news and information about Norfolk Public Schools. I'm your host, Karen Tanner. And with me today is a very special guest. We have Sonia Bridgers. She's a career and technology education teacher specialist at Norfolk Technical Center. And we're here to talk about Computer Science Education Week. Welcome to NPS Now. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to have you on the show. We had a great conversation before the show with you. So let's just jump right on in. What is Computer Science Education Week? And how long has our district been recognized in this special week? So Computer Science Education Week um, is an opportunity for us to engage our students in computer science activities that may include the Hour of Code, which falls under the Computer Science Education Week. We have engaged in this particular initiative for about eight years now, and um, four years with Hour of Code activities in our career and technical education classes. Yeah, let's talk about some of those activities. So what do you do on the elementary and the secondary levels? So on the secondary levels, we engage our students with robots of various kinds, and I happen to have oh. a couple. So we have a Spheros robot as well as an indoor air drone. So these two uh, robots, we are able to help our students to learn to code them, um, to go through mazes and different activities that have problem solving skills, team working skills. And then at the elementary level, we also surprisingly have Spheros that even a kindergarten student can work with and um, code as well and go through the mazes and use their iPads through our Apple initiative to code and do block coding, JavaScript, and all kinds of coding activities that go along. We also have mechanoid robots. Wow. We have different websites that the students use um, and different coding activities through code org as well to help students learn more about coding and to enhance their coding abilities. Are those activities different for elementary and secondary or? So they are different for elementary and secondary, um, but there's the opportunity for them to be similar. So the students also use, at the elementary level, they use um, websites as well to code as well as the different drones and robots that we have. So there's some similarities there but there are also some unique differences. Um, with the mechanoid robot that we have, that's more of a secondary level and the students are able to engage with the robot and see exactly how to go about making that robot say certain things, do certain <laughs> things, and do a lot of fun activities and engaging things with it. Yeah, and you mentioned Hour of a Code, but what specifically are we doing to celebrate Hour of Code? So to specifically celebrate it, we have different um, career and technical education classes that are engaged in various activities. So with, whether it's the coding of the robots, whether it is learning JavaScript, whether it is learning HTML coding, um, they're also going to Google First, which is a new and free uh, tool that they are able to use to learn different types of coding, Python coding. So from kindergarten oh, to wow. 12th grade, all of our students are exposed to so many different facets of coding and computer science. Why do you feel it's important for us to recognize Computer Science Education Week and Hour of Code? So our students, we have to prepare them to be ready for high paying jobs, high demand jobs and careers. And in order to do that, we have to help them to become computational thinkers. We have to help them learn how to be problem solvers and how to work as a team to get things done. Because in the real world, that's how we do things. So in the hour of code and through our computer science um, education week initiatives, all of the different activities in which we engage the students gives them the opportunity to be able to put all of those skills to use. And that's how we um, create these great uh, citizens of the 21st century. What do we do outside of, uh, you know, the Hour of Code and Education Week for our students? In, in the curriculum with this as well? So in our curriculum, we have um, started to engage all of our career and technical education classes with um, 
augmented reality. So one of our classes is sports medicine. And so we found augmented reality apps that helps the sports medicine teachers help students to see the inner workings of the body through augmented reality. So we do that in our business classes, technology, family and consumer science, and the list goes on and on for all of the classes that we have in career and technical education. Um, we also are offering cybersecurity because that's a growing field and our students need to be exposed to some of that as well. So um, cybersecurity, augmented reality, we just know that it's this is our opportunity to help grow our students and prepare them to be productive 21st century learners and citizens. So how does computer science help students of all ages become more effective, you think? I think the, they become more effective because through the problem solving, every day, it doesn't matter what careers we're in, what jobs we have, there's a problem solving element that goes along with our day-to-day -day experiences. So whether it's the problem solving, whether it's decision making, whether it's coming to a consensus um, between a team or a group on how something should be done. Um, when I observe classes and I see them with the Sphero robots in the mazes. Well, they have to decide how to make that happen, but they have to work together and they have to compromise with one another and listen to one another about how to make those things happen. So that's really important as we prepare our students to go out into the world um, post-secondary. So you think we're doing it effectively throughout the curriculum? I definitely think we are. I think we have all of the components that are necessary to prepare our students through our coding initiatives, through our computer science, and through all of the career and technical education courses that we offer. I, I do. I know parents and students alike are like, wow, this is really interesting. So I'm excited to see the reaction of the students and how they receive Computer Education Technology Week and Hour of Code. Thank you for coming on the show and sharing this valuable information with us. Thank you so much for having me today. Great. And we want you to stay tuned for more NPS Now. Welcome back to NPS Now. I'm Steve Sutmiller, Senior Coordinator of Athletics. Today in the studio, we have two special guests. We have Sean Knight from the Virginia High School League, Mari High School graduate, and then we have Tony Brothers, an NBA official uh, and a graduate of Booker T. Washington High School. Guys, um, we have you down here to talk about a topic that's um, a real important topic in high school sports, and that's sportsmanship. So, um, Sean, talk a little bit about yourself first, and then let's get into sportsmanship. Well, I, I, certainly sportsmanship is one of those things that's always been near and dear to my heart. I was very blessed coming through Norfolk Public Schools and Maury High School uh, at a time where we had coaches who, who really valued that, who really valued the development of the whole person uh, and really prepared you for life outside of, of high school and outside of athletics. Uh, and so today, I have the opportunity to, in some ways, give back serving the mm -hmm. Virginia High School League and uh, serving our young people uh, is really, uh, really a joy for me. Okay. Um, Tony, talk, talk a little bit about your role um, as an NBA official um, and, and how you got to that point. Well, actually, I started locally, refereeing the little kids, and then into high school basketball here locally. I spent three years um, refereeing here, and then I went into the CBA, spent four years in the CBA, and then into the NBA. Okay. Yeah. All right. Very good. So let's, let's get right into this topic. Um, Sean, uh, let's define sportsmanship um, uh, how we want to define it through the Virginia High School League. Uh, sportsmanship uh, from the Virginia High School League standpoint really is about mutual respect uh, through competition uh, among players, coaches, officials, and, and the spectators. Uh, we, we really want everyone to understand and, and respect uh, every aspect of that equation. We all enjoy the games, we enjoy the competition, uh, but it's vital that everybody rem remembers their role uh, in ensuring not only that those contests are still here for our young people, but making sure uh, that those contests uh, evolve and, and continue as they should be. Uh, that win or lose, everyone leaves the field having had a good experience. Uh, and it's difficult to do that when any aspect of that equation uh, loses sight of why we're there. We're okay. there to, to celebrate the young people and, and not to make it about, about us. So uh, we talk, you know, the crust is respect. 
Um, and we've lost a little bit of that, uh, of that respect uh, towards any game. Um, and looking at numbers last year, uh, player ejections, over 700 ejections, um, coaching ejections, um, over 70 ejections from the coaches, um, and, and then just the, the sports that, that are really kind of highlighting this. Um, what, what sports are we looking at that kind of are abusing this? Um, well, I think to some degree the, the elephant in the room sometimes is football strictly but surely by numbers I and mean, just the volume of players and the young people that are involved in it tend to drive those numbers higher you know, when we get into the spring. Uh, soccer tends to tends to be an issue. We have uh, taken some measures uh, from a rule standpoint to, to try to uh, address those uh, those uh, rules within within the, the game of soccer that used to really be objectionable, uh, that really were not issues of sportsmanship, uh, little handballs and those mm -hmm. kinds of things. And so we've kind of taken those things out, uh, but the numbers still remain alarming. Uh, and some of that really is is indicative. Uh, of the surrounding culture and the, our wider culture that has really become more divisive, more combative. Uh, and that's why it's so important, education-based sports is so important because uh, our, the mission of education-based sports is very different uh, than some other opportunities that young people have. We're, we're trying to prepare young people for life after high school, for life uh, in a broader community where people don't always uh, come from your same background, who don't always think the way you do. Uh, but at the end of the day, we have to figure out a way to coexist and in some, in some situations actually work together uh, for a common cause despite our differences. And, uh, and education-based athletics and activities really, uh, really pushes that. Now, obviously, the numbers aren't where we'd like to see them. Uh, and so we're still pushing against uh, that, that trend that uh, exists in our broader culture. Okay. All right, Tony, we mentioned respect. I mean, you're at the highest level of athletics. I mean, the greatest athletes in the world. Um, from your time in, in this league, as you, as you have grown in the league uh, and been around, how about respect from, from that aspect? Are, are these players, do they show the respect? Um, are they demonstrating the respect? Because we mimic a lot of things that, that the people that you work with. Yeah, well, I think in the instance of the NBA, you see, but you don't hear. So you may see someone charge towards an official and you think they're saying something that they're really not saying. A lot of times they just don't want to come out of the game. And so they know the coach is going to take them out of the game. They missed an assignment. They didn't do something they were supposed to do. So they deflect and they make it seem like it's the official's issue. Sometimes it's even playful. Um, and, but it's because of relationships that exist there. So one of the things that I have been trying to do here with high school basketball is have coaches meetings with officials where we start the season out where we all get together where they can get to know each other and their relationships there so that they don't come in like they're the police like they're wearing a badge instead of a patch mm -hmm. and part of that's the officials problem because the egos get involved and when you have someone telling you, you didn't do something correctly versus you feeling you did something correctly I mean it's all really judgment and angles and everything and so uh, what I'm trying to do is create relationships uh, because that's the thing that powers the NBA are the relationships and the fact okay. that we have the same 30 teams and we see them all the time. All right, so l l let's talk about the, the player's responsibility because obviously everybody has a responsibility in this, but let's talk about uh, what we expect from players at the high school um, at the level and then obviously we can talk a little bit about the NBA but as in a high school official sure. as you lead those mm -hmm. you know how do you um, discuss that with your officials as well so player responsibility I mean obviously when you're talking about young people often uh, players and their responsibility and how they embrace their responsibility really is going to be a function of how their leadership uh, establishes those responsibilities and where those bars where those lines are established uh, and that but and what that ex level of expectation is uh, and again one of the challenges that we have in our schools now is that more and more of our coaches are non-teacher coaches mm -hmm. uh, and uh, again well-intentioned many many very very knowledgeable about their specific sport uh, but when you don't come up through the ranks of education and understanding uh, adolescent development, understanding, uh, you know, understanding basic principles of pedagogy, sometimes that presents a challenge for how to communicate effectively. And as, uh, as Tony's alluded to, I mean, the, re the respect is all about relationship. It, it grows out of relationship. Uh, and so one of the things that we are really pushing to do uh, through our statewide coaches education program is help undergird coaches with that understanding and provide more opportunities for growth there. 
uh, so that they understand, uh, to Tony's point, what they see or what they think they see when they watch the, the upper levels on television really may not necessarily be what's going on, mm -hmm. uh, but at, at the high school level, they begin to mimic what they believe they're seeing. And so we are trying to, to help them separate uh, perception from reality uh, and, and trying to encourage them, again, to set high standards and, and high expectations and high degrees of accountability for our young people because that's the, that's the world they will enter. They will enter a world that, uh, that won't make exceptions or turn a blind eye to certain behaviors. And so uh, we, we certainly expect our young people to do that, but more importantly, we expect, again, in educational-based athletics, we expect the leaders of those young people to establish those norms and establish sure. those parameters for what's acceptable and what's not. Okay, so uh, another um, um, neat stat that uh, Tom Dolan provided to all the area meetings was, you know, just, um, you know, what these infractions are. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, fighting um, is, is obviously one, um, and it's, it's around 155 ejections from, from that. Um, and then we have just the, the profanity directed towards officials. Um, and then we have the racial slurs um, that are directed. Um, to each other, uh, to an official, to a coach. So, from the official standpoint, you know, how do you deal with um, uh, some of these things? Because it's not always unsportsmanlike. Some sometimes it's friendly bantering. Mm -hmm. um, but anytime uh, that those, how do you address those with coaches, players? To, well, to des you know. Well, as Sean said, like it really starts with the coach, and that's why we have a coaches meeting. We meet with the teams. We meet with the coach because a lot of times the coach actually creates that type of environment for the kids. They're always against us. They're always against us. They're always mm -hmm. against us. And so then the kids can't have any respect for the person that's always against them. And so what I have tried to do with the officials is to say, when you run into that instance where a kid says something that to you is offensive in his neighborhood, it could be a term of endearment, go to the coach first. Tell the coach, say, hey coach, look, this is, this is what he said and we just can't have this. Now if the coach is in the mindset that they're against us, then there's no help there, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's why I say it all starts there. If we're gonna be um, trying to pull back, still we protect the integrity of the game. So that's from calls that we make to the way people perform to the things that they say and everything. And we have to be fair in that. We can't allow one kid to say something here and then tech the kid down here. But what I would like to see them do is to be able to go to the coach and say, hey, coach, he said this. The coach knows if this person and this person, and when they say this, what that meant. All of my officials may not know it. Culturally, their right. backgrounds might not allow them mm -hmm. to know. But now, if the coach doesn't say, hey, no, that's not good. You come, you sit down, right? Then that behavior becomes acceptable to the kid. And then how do we manage them? We can't manage them. Right. We don't know them well enough to do it. So. Um, as Sean was saying, and my focus has been one on the referees because we have referees with serious attitude problems, right? When I came into the NBA, I had one. You know, you go in there and it's like people are coming at you all the time, and it really is just a defense mechanism for the fact that you make mistakes, but once you realize that you're always going to make mistakes, then it becomes less impactive when someone comes to you. So I'm just trying to take all of the holes that I've stepped in in my 26 years and transfer that over to the officials here because hopefully we can get a better understanding of each other. So, go ahead. And, and a lot of what Tony is trying to do from the official side, from a league standpoint, we're trying to meet them the other way. Uh, where more and more each year our, our coaches and our officials have to go, have to go through rules clinics prior mm -hmm. to every season. And more and more what we're doing is we're getting the coaches and the officials in the same room for those rules clinics, particularly when we have an opportunity to do them in person. Uh, and again, it's, it's always good when everybody hears the same thing at the same time, but by getting them in the room together, it, it allows for some relationship building, it allows for uh, the, the tearing down of some of those artificial walls and some of those things that sometimes make those relationships combative. Uh, so the coaches see, well, no, this, he's actually a pretty good guy. I just I got might have got a bad call last year, but but he's really a good guy. He wasn't trying to get me. And and from the official standpoint, they come to understand that the coaches, while they sometimes react in the heat of a moment, they come to they begin to humanize each other and understand that we're all in this for the same purpose. And I think to the extent that uh, the officials continue to do that, and our and our coaches from our standpoint continue to do that, I think if we can get the adult relationships on in the yeah, right place, that's, that's mm -hmm. the I think it'd be a lot easier for us to work together. To, 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 to uh, fortify our, our young people and ensure that they're prepared for what's next. Okay. Well, I mean, that's an ongoing uh, 
process that uh, every, everybody has yes. to have some buy-in. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So let, let's talk about um, let's talk about the fans mm -hmm. because they're part of this as well. Um, we need them to respect um, the the time that they're in the building in the stands, um, just as much as we want our athletes to, just as much as we want our coaches to. So. Um, again, from the league standpoint, um, how do we address fan, uh, the sportsmanship with fans? Yeah, for, for us, some of, that, some of it really comes back to our member schools and the administrators in our schools. Uh, and again, much like we expect our coaches to establish parameters for what's acceptable and what's not, uh, for our spectators and our fans, our parents, it's important that building level administrators establish uh, what's acceptable, what's not, and enforcing some of those things. And again, uh, some of that, again, is about relationship. You know, more and more in this social media world uh, where people really are not held accountable for what they say and everybody's got an opinion and they feel like their opinion, uh, opinion uh, matters more than everybody else, uh, one of the things we're trying to get our, our, our parents and our fans to understand uh, is that if you continue to go after those officials the way you are, we're not going to have anybody to, to officiate these games. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there is a dearth of officials. It is not a Virginia problem. It is not a high school problem. It is a national problem at all levels. Uh, and much, much of that is because of the, the, what they're having to endure now. Again, not, not from coaches as much or not from the athletes, <clears throat> but from the spectators. Uh, and so if we, if we don't corral that, if we don't work together to corral that and help everybody understand that, again, every component of that equation is, is essential to what we're trying to do and begin to treat people with respect, uh, we're going to start looking at, at coach-officiated games mm -hmm. if, if, we don't, if we don't change what we're doing. So from the official standpoint, uh, I mean, well, how, how do you deal with these fans? Well, even the, the, one of the causes of that, like when you talk about not having enough officials, one of the causes of budgets of schools. So when you have JV basketball and you only have two officials, those officials are watching north-south. Right. The fans and the coaches are watching east-west, right? So there's a different angle on everything. So the coach may be correct. The fan may be correct when they're yelling because the person got hit. You don't have that third person there. And so it's very difficult to even have a conversation with a coach who's looking. He's looking this way. He right. saw the hit on the arm. It's very difficult to do that. And so. For us, trying to get to a point where we can take the craft that we have and bring that craft in where it's going to be pleasing to the fans, to the coaches, to the players, is very difficult because we're like the policeman. If he's doing 85, if you're doing 85 and a policeman pulls you over, he gives you a warning, he's a good policeman, gives you a ticket, he's a bad policeman, but you were doing 85. That's our job. That's our life. And so from the fan perspective, I still believe it goes back to the coach. If you watched certain teams, and I won't call names, but mm -hmm. there were teams back when I was officiating here that they went as the coach went. But now if you think about these officials are coming out at that point, and they're starting in JV basketball, and this is what they're getting, they stop. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. And so that's why we lose them. So we have about 30 new recruits, young people. I've been getting them from Old Dominion. The intramurals, high school, we do a thing with Norfolk Public Schools where the, the kids can come and work the Little League games on the, on the weekends, and we're trying to do this. But even at the Mighty Mites games, you know, I have gone and refereed the Mighty Mites game on a Saturday, and the ladies told me, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and they all believe they have the next LeBron James. Mm -hmm. They all believe that. And there's only 400 players in the NBA and they draft 60 every year, the odds of this one making it to their slim to none, that's not to mean that they cannot play basketball, but you know, it's that mentality fueled by the reaction of that coach, which in turn goes to the kids. So they, the parents, just a, a little more, the parents or fans, i.e. Mm -hmm. parents, have another thing going on because they have an issue with the coach. The coach isn't playing their kid, so they're already upset when they get in. So they're sitting there, and if something happens, they're mad because John is in the game and my kid's not in the game. And then if their kid gets in the game, and he probably doesn't play that much because he might not be as good as John, now fouls are called on his kid. Now it's the referee's fault when she's really mad with the coach. And so I think, you know, I'm not trying to put everything on the coach because, as I said, I am working on the officials, the ego problems and all of those things that exist. But I think the fans issues are a direct correlation to the coach. Okay. And the reality is the coach is really at the, at the intersection yes. of all of those all relationships. Of they are. Yes. Yep. Uh, the, the official, the parents, 
the athlete the coach really is mm -hmm. at okay. the epicenter of all of that and that's that's why we're really uh, we're, we're changing how we're approaching our coaches education to better prepare our coaches uh, hopefully uh, to deal with the social emotional aspects of the, the, the athlete development but also making more resources available to them uh, to help them better deal with parents and, and, and officials. Yes yeah, so that's that's a good question resources what you know where could you where would you direct either parents um, and, and we do direct our coaches to um, some sites but as a parent uh, where, where would you suggest for them to uh, get some information on sportsmanship? Uh, as a parent, uh, you can go to the Virginia High School League website. Uh, we actually have a link there for specifically for parents, uh, and there are a number of resources, courses on sportsmanship, courses, uh, they're sports-specific courses to help parents understand the specific game better. Uh, sometimes it's not a matter of uh, it's not a matter of, of having a personal agenda against an official. Sometimes it's just it's just blissful ignorance of the rules of the right. game. Uh, there are a number of resources uh, through the National uh, Federation of State High School Associations, NFHS, on their NFHS Learn site available to parents. Many of those courses are free, uh, you know, where parents can, can learn more about their sport uh, or their child's sport, learn more about how to appropriately interact with their coaches, uh, and learn uh, how to conduct themselves more appropriately as spectators okay. uh, so that they're not an embarrassment for their children. Uh, one <laughs> of the things that we hear often uh, from uh, some young athletes when we have encounters of poor sportsmanship on the part of fans or parents uh, is the children are embarrassed by their parents' behavior. Uh, and I think uh, we, we had a, a, an area meeting uh, last year where we, we were there talking with students, talking with parents, uh, and a young athlete, young student athlete, stood up and said, hey, you know, I just really want to tell my parents, you know, to stop embarrassing me mm -hmm. at my games. Uh, and often the parents think they're advocating, uh, but there's a more appropriate way to advocate, a way okay. that you can positively advocate uh, without uh, causing, causing disruption for, for the game or embarrassment for the child. All right, well, again, guys, number one, appreciate you taking time out because I know you're very busy, both of you, uh, for being down here to talk about an important topic. Um, good information. Uh, and again, we want to thank you for taking, taking the time to be here. Thank you, Tyson. Right. Right. More NPS now after this. We want to thank you for watching NPS Now. It airs weekly on WNPS Channel 47, or you can view us online at www.npsk12.com. If you have any great story ideas or events happening at your school, please be sure to email us at npsnews at npsk12.com. Again, we want to thank you for watching NPS Now.